So welcome back, Social 30. This is our second last lesson looking at liberalism economically. We have lesson number nine, contemporary challenges with Keynesian economics. This lesson is mainly designed around the economic theories of Friedman and Hayek and the political implementation by Thatcher and Reagan. So I've had you do some reading in the book from chapters six and eight. So you should have some general background on Reagan and Thatcher and Friedman and maybe Hayek, but I'd like to add to what the textbook has done for you. So at the beginning of lesson nine, we have some notes for you. So I'm gonna go over the notes with you, but I want you to consider the fact that the notes are here typed up for you in lesson nine, waiting for you in the Google Classroom. You don't have to write everything down. You can write down a few key things that you think you might use to the essay that's looming, but uh, if you need to read it all, then just go back to the document and reread it. So challenges to modern liberal economics. So when I talk about modern liberal economics, I'm talking about the legacy of Keynes in America that begins with FDR and the New Deal. In Canada, it really begins with uh, President Mackenzie King. Of course, there were some beginnings with the progressives like Teddy Roosevelt in, in America, but it didn't last. It didn't stick for as long. But starting in America with FDR, it sticks for a little while. So the collapse of Keynesian economics. The 1950s and 60s were marked by years of economic growth in Western liberal democracies. The economic policies of Keynes seemed to be working flawlessly. The jobs were plentiful and prosperity was being enjoyed by all segments of society. The social welfare system, progressive taxation, and the rise of unions helped ensure that even the poor were benefiting from the economic boom. Economic disparity was a non-issue. And here you have a visual that looks at the relative gains of different economic percentiles. And you can see that although there is a gap between the rich and the poor, um, real family income gap is less than than there is now. This is the gap now, this is the gap back then. You can see the gap was very, very narrow. In Canada, the United States, part of the economic growth was aided by the efforts to rebuild Europe after the Second World War, but remarkably, European nations that had been devastated by the war were recovering rapidly. Most of the Western liberal democracies were experiencing a baby boom. During this period, another factor driving the economy forward, Keynesian economics was working but by the 1970s. A couple of issues arose that led some to seek alternatives to Keynesian economics. The first issue was the development of what became known as stagflation. Keynes had taught that inflation and unemployment were opposites. If one went up, the other would naturally fall. You controlled inflation by allowing unemployment and vice versa, according to the adherents of modern liberal economics. The problem of the 1970s, though, was that both unemployment and inflation were rising simultaneously. So the economy was stagnant, it wasn't growing, and unemployment was an issue, and yet the prices kept going up, the inflation part, the stagflation. This meant the economy was stagnating, unemployment rising, while at the same time inflation rates were climbing, hence stagflation. There were multiple reasons why this was happening. Generally, the decades-long boom could not continue forever, and even in a Keynesian economy, there would have to be a slowdown, where jobs were no longer being created. The rise in prices coincides with the oil embargoes of the early 1970s, through the OPEC crisis we talked about in grade 10, where the price of oil increased dramatically in a short period of time. This had a ripple effect throughout the economy, forcing prices of almost everything to rise. The baby boom both stimulated the economy, but also stressed it. For children are economic consumers, not producers. They require spending, both by families and the government, but do not contribute yet to the economy through things like income tax and job creation. Importantly, Keynesian economists had no answer for this dilemma. The second issue was the fear of rising government debt. Politicians opposed to government interventionism and interventionist economic policies began to suggest that the social programs of Keynesian economies were creating a massive debt that would shackle future generations. I like to call it intergenerational tyranny. The debt that we have today on things we've enjoyed today 
is a price that generations not even yet born will be paying, intergenerational tyranny. For the most part, this was a political ploy as debt was well within a manageable level then, not now. Statistics from the United States government show that through the 1970s, the debt to GDP ratio was steady and at levels lower than in the past 40 years. So compare that with now, and you'll see that uh, debt is a bigger concern now than it was then. So this is what it was then relative to GDP, and you can see that debt's a bigger issue now. So if they were concerned in the 70s, they should be really alarmed now. Reaganomics and Thatcherism, the American politician that was most pr uh, prominent in the effort to spread fear of growing debt caused by government spending was Ronald Reagan. In his failed attempt to gain the Republican nomination for president in 76, he told the story of the welfare queen, a hypothetical woman who was earning a small fortune by collecting multiple welfare checks from the government without ever doing any work. To hardworking, tax-paying Americans, this image was troublesome. Reagan did not get elected in 76, but four years later, as stagflation continued to persist, his fearful message of an Im imminent debt crisis and the welfare queens and kings who were taking advantage of the social welfare system took him to the White House. So what we saw was a culture of dependency created in America, a culture of dependency where people said, you know what, I'm going to be dependent on government, freedom through government, and I'm not going to work for myself. And when more and more people drop out of the workforce, they're not creating any wealth, they become just a, a, a liability, a drain on society. So Reagan won both the 1980 and 1984 elections, and in 1988, his vice president, George Sr., George Bush Sr., won that election. His promises of economic reform were key to his electoral success. Reagan's economic policies became known as Reaganomics, and they forever changed America and the Western liberal democratic world. Reaganomics will come to Canada. Brian Mulroney will put them into practice federally. Reaganomics will come to Alberta. Ralph Klein will introduce Reaganomics here. While Ronald Reagan was rising to power in the United States, the United Kingdom was going through a similar transformation, and I want to make this key. Thatcher is ahead of Reagan. She comes first. So... They, we have Reagan first in, in the notes, but Thatcher is an inspiration for Reagan. Its economy had already been crippled uh, by stagflation, and they were particularly hard hit by a series of worker strikes. One of the cornerstones of Keynesian economics was the promotion of unions to protect workers' rights, but by the 1970s, many in the UK had come to the conclusion that the unions had become too powerful. The unions were perceived, especially by proponents of capitalism, to be able to hold the country hostage by going on strike. The 1979 general election resulted in a historic result. The first prime female prime minister was elected, Margaret Thatcher. Thatcher soon transformed the UK's economy in the same manner as Reagan would eventually do in America. In the UK, the policies were known as Thatcherism. But Reagan and Thatcher, these are political people. They are inspired by economists. Who inspired them? The economic policies of both Thatcher and Reagan embraced were directly tied to the work of Frederick von Hayek, an Austrian economist who was a contemporary of Keynes. Hayek had written that the key to any successful economy was to allow the suppliers to have economic freedom. In essence, Hayek was suggesting that capitalism could work, that the market would correct itself, just as capitalists had, already, had always preached. Hayek's ideas were ignored for decades, primarily because Keynesian economy, economics seemed to be successful. By the late 1970s, Keynesian economics was not working, and an alternative was sought. Hayek's supply-side economics, and you'll see it referred to that on multiple choice tests, supply-side economics was that alternative, because this was a return to classic liberal capitalist beliefs. This economic system has been known around the world as neoliberalism economically. In the United States, where liberalism was seen as a negative term, they called it neoconservatism. So in a confusing way, you're going to see it named this, neoconservatism. You're also going to see it named as this, neoliberalism. And you're going to also see it referred to as supply side. So why is it supply side? Quickly, it's called supply side because Keynesian economics is demand side. How do you grow the economy? By having more demand. So it's demand side economics. 
supply side economics, how do you grow the economy? By encouraging more supply. So they call it supply side because you're going to grow the economy by producing more supply. How can you give an incentive to suppliers to supply more? You tax them less. If we tax the suppliers less, they will supply more. And as they supply more, they have to hire more workers. The economy will grow. So it's called supply side economics because you're going to grow the economy from the supply side of the ledger by giving tax breaks to the rich. We also have in the United States Milton Friedman as a disciple of Hayek. So what are their main ideas? Deregulation of business. We're going to take a step back, allow business to be unfettered by, by, by the government. Privatization of government-owned businesses. So in, in Alberta, we privatize Alberta government telephones. We privatize the Alberta Liquor Control Board. Uh, Canada-wide, we privatize things like Air Canada. Uh, reductions to social program spending. Restriction of the power of unions. We're going to see free trade, flat, flat tax in places to replace progressive taxation. Why should rich people pay more taxes? You know, why should they have to pay a higher percentage? That's actually discouraging them from working harder. Let's just have a flat tax. Everybody pays $5,000, like a head tax, like in biblical times. Tax breaks to corporations. Some countries went so far as having regressive taxation. You make more, you get to pay less. They thought the benefits would trickle down. Each of these changes would act to uh, the benefit of businesses, the suppliers. The supporters of supply-side economics argued that the benefits did not stop with the economic elite, but they would trickle down to all in the form of job creation and greater competition between businesses. In general, these changes would mark a return to classic liberal economic philosophies. Neoliberal, or in North America, often we say neocon policy spread all across the Western liberal democracies. We've got Mulroney, and I already mentioned we'll have our good friend Uncle Ralph here in Alberta, Ralph Vaughan. Neocon politics. Though we are primarily concerned about their economics, connected to neoconservatism, Chapter 8 does talk about the political side. One of the key political philosophies was an increase in the value of the military. While spending on social programs was being reduced, spending on the military was decreased. This was tied to an accompanying growth in nationalism among neocons and an acceptance of using their military as a tool to enforce their will around the world. Foreign policy should be there to promote the American lifestyle. So if we need to attack Libya to defend American values, we attack Libya. You know, we use Tomahawk cruise missiles and we kill Muammar Gaddafi's daughter. It's all good. So why is it good? Because the opposite was socialism was the road to serfdom. And I, I love that, that idea, that if you invite government into your life economically, you'll become you'll become um, bonded to them and in bondage their slavery. So what is neoconservatism? An assessment of policies of neoconservatism have been around now for over three decades. So it is fair to determine if they have achieved success. Have they, had limit, have they limited government debt? Have they reduced unemployment uh, while controlling inflation? Have they brought a degree of prosperity to all? And the answer is basically no. No, you know what? We have more debt now. We have more um, unemployment in Alberta now. We have more gaps between the rich and poor. So the trickle down from the rich to, to the rest didn't happen, and that's why it's being shown as an outhouse here. Because if you're sitting down here, you don't want the stuff up here to trickle down. So many people look at this idea of trickle-down theory and saying the only thing it did was it created more wealth disparity. It helped the 1% top earners in the United States and Canada. And this is where we get the term 1% against the 99%. This is how the wealth of the 1% takes off because of neoliberal, neocon policies. You can see that it just explodes. So now we have people that live lives of the, the nouveau riche again, right? The nouveau riche, uh, the new rich, that uh, we can't even fathom the type of life they have. So the inequality has been accompanied by a growing trend of limiting social mobility. So it's harder and harder to transcend classes, to be born in one and to die in another. Um, so yeah, that's the summary there. So we've got some additional stuff that you can go down some rabbit holes at home. Uh, this is in pink because Anne Rand inspires Hayek, right? 
Ayn Rand is an economist that uh, when you listen to her, you can get neo-economic liberalism at its purest. So I would suggest to you that it is a good video to watch at home. But I do have some additional notes here for you. In summary, what is Friedman saying? The free market, not the government, ensures protection of individual rights and standards of quality and delivers extraordinary prosperity. What do students lack in their essays? Clear argumentation. What do we have there? Clear argumentation. That's a clear argument. The free market, not the government, ensures protection of individual rights and standards of quality and delivers extraordinary prosperity. That's an argument that could be a topic sentence in a paragraph, and then you go and defend it. You find evidence. Keeping in mind that we have an essay that is due a week from Monday, and the essay is talking about the, the conflict between individualism and collectivism, and which one really helps the nation, and which one hurts the nation. So continuing with that idea, we have more insight by Milton Friedman. He says the great advantages, the great advances, sorry, of civilization have never come from centralized government. Newton, Einstein, Bohr, Shakespeare, Milton, Pasternak, Whit Whitney, Edison, Ford, Adams, Nightingale, all these people, none of them, none of them, when they opened new frontiers in human knowledge and understanding and literature and technological possibilities or in the relief of human misery in response, none of them did this in response to the government directives. So how do we, how do we provide relief to human misery? How do we open up new frontiers in our knowledge and understanding? It's not through socialism. It's not through communism. It's not through government directives. It's through freedom. It's through capitalism. So this is, a, this is an excellent quote by Friedman, uh, defending, defending individualism, defending liberalism. So in essence, what are we talking about here? In essence, we're talking about perhaps greed is good. Perhaps greed is good, and perhaps socialism is force. But what is taxation? Taxation is theft. When the government taxes me, they're stealing from me. And they're using force. Because if they're, they're saying to me, Ross McBride, if you don't pay your taxes, you're going to go to jail. That, that's a threat of force. There, that's no different than armed robbery. right? So taxation is theft. And statism is a mind-created virus. And the idea here is we need to be as free of the state as possible, and freedom will unlock our true potential. And therefore, what should be guiding our freedom? Self-interest, greed. Greed is good. So we have some videos here that we'll watch in a minute once I'm done going through here about uh, greed being good, some quotes from, uh, from Friedman. But let me get through some more quotes here. Hayek says, economies are too complex. They're just too complex. Too complex for Justin Trudeau to manage. Justin Trudeau, in the election campaign in 2016, what did he say? He said, and the budget will balance itself. That was his promise to Canada. The budget will balance itself. And since then, he has spent more money than all other uh, you know, leaders within your lifetime combined. He has, in the, in the five years that he's been in office, spent more than Harper did in his entire time in office. We have more debt now than we've ever had before, because guess what? The budget didn't balance itself, and the issue isn't just COVID. The budget didn't balance itself before COVID, because he doesn't understand economics. So no one person can understand economics. There's too much happening in, the, in an economy. No one person could organize all of Wetaskiwin's economy. There's so many different businesses doing different things. There's not even one person that can really organize this school. Could I go and tell Mr. Wei how to teach calculus? Well, I'm pretty good at calculus, to be honest. But no, no, I can't. He is the master in that domain. And he can't come to teach this. So, and this is simple compared to running an entire economy, an economy the size of the United States that's measured in the trillions. If you have a $21 trillion economy, you think Donald Trump can, can manage that? Dude can't even manage his hair. Biden. Man, he can't even manage whatever that sniffing problem that he has is. So I don't have faith in the government either. Centralization of knowledge is good in theory, but in practice, economies are most efficient when millions of people act independent using the information available to them at the grassroots level. 
That's what capitalism unlocks is the, the combined intelligence of millions of people. In the 1980s, a young college student, Jimmy Wales, read an article from Hayek and was fascinated by the contrast between limited individual knowledge and the possibilities of pooled wisdom. The open source software movement had already demonstrated the power of mass collaboration and in the 1990s, new wiki, open-ended tools, led him and a partner to launch a experimental website, Wikipedia. So the power of Wikipedia is the idea of pooled uh, wisdom. I'm going to just go out on, on a limb and think that, you know, I bet Wikipedia knows more about stuff than you do. You might know more about one thing than Wikipedia does, but I'm sure Wikipedia has more intelligence than you do across the board. Why is that? Well, Wikipedia is the product of pooled wisdom. Same thing applies economically. You can't allow one person, Stalin, or one small group, Gosplan, to essentially plan an economy. We need to empower millions closest to the economy. And that's what capitalism does. It's the wisdom of the crowd. So in practice, socialism didn't and doesn't work. Socialism can never, could never have worked because it's based on false premises of both human psychology and society and gross ignorance of human economy. The champions of socialism call themselves progressive, but they recommend a system which is characterized by rigid observance of routine and by a resistance to every kind of improvement. They call themselves liberal, but they are intent upon abolishing liberty. They call themselves democrat, but they yearn for di dictatorship. They call themselves revolutionaries, but they want to make the government omnipotent. They promise the blessings of the Garden of Eden, but they want to transform the world into a gigantic post office. And I don't know about you, I don't have a lot of faith in the post office. Apologies if mom and dad work there. I don't have faith in public education, and I work here. So Ayn Rand says, and I think she captures it here, America's abundance was created not by public sacrifices to the common good, but by the productive genius of free men and women, she means men in the all of us sense, of free men who pursued their own personal interests and the making of their own private fortunes. They did not starve the people to pay for America's industrialization, they gave the people better jobs. I'm thinking of, of Ford here, right? Creating the, the middle class. They gave the people better jobs, higher wages, and cheaper goods with every new machine they invented, with every scientific discovery or technological advance. And thus, the whole country was moving forward and profiting, not suffering every step of the way. So that's some of the argument in favor of Ayn Rand and in favor of Hayek and Friedman and, and, and Thatcher and Reagan, but on the opposite side of things, before we continue, on the opposite side of things, we have things like this. On strike for work that sustains families. A living wage equals quality care. That these people are, are um, caregivers. It's the United Healthcare Workers um, Board. If you zoom right in and, and read the fine, and sometimes it's important to do that on these protest signs. Zoom right in. So these are healthcare workers. And they're like, you know what? We'd like to provide quality care. But we in the healthcare industry, we don't we're not receiving a living wage. So if you're if your caregiver, if your nurse has to have a second job and she's tired on the job and then she gives you um, you know dangerous service, or maybe she neglects your needs, um, there's an easy way to fix it. Pay your nurse a better wage so she doesn't have to go work at Walmart after her shift. So these nurses and doctors and, and other healthcare workers, they're on strike for work that can actually sustain their family. And what do they want? What's their goal? So we can see a problem here. The problem is, is they're not getting paid enough. Their goal is a living wage. And what's the means to the goal? Let's get 15 bucks an hour. Let's get a minimum wage of $15 an hour. So within that source, I can quickly break down the nuances of it, the details, and figure out what's happening. You need to be able to do that on the diploma. So can capitalism be progressive and provide a quality life for all? Should we bargain our market value 
on behalf of others who lack the value to determine a livable wage in a free market. This source is suggesting that waiting for a livable wage in a free market without the government, she's going to die. She is going to die. She's surrounded by a chain, so that's metaphorical that she's you know imprisoned, and the the gift waiting for her is going to be starvation. That if government doesn't inject itself into her problem, she's going to starve waiting for a living wage. That the capitalist isn't going to provide. So this is a criticism of liberalism. This is a criticism of neoliberalism. So if you need more about Thatcher, there's some links here as well. Thatcher's uh, one of those people that has lots of great quotes too. So I've included some quotes. I've gone back and given you some more stuff about Reagan and summarized, well, what did he do? So he cuts regulation on business. He was meant to cut the growth of government spending, but at the same time he cuts it on those welfare queens. He spends more on the military than, than all the other presidents. So did he deal with the government debt? No, he did not, but he did win the Cold War, so that's important. There are lots of more links here for you if you don't know much about Reagan and, and what he did and, and how he wrestled control back to the economy. But this whole deregulation um, led some people to start questioning whether or not anyone was actually paying attention to the economy. So if you've ever seen the movie Wolf of Wall Street, uh, you know, he makes a lot of money in Wolf of Wall Street, right? because he's corrupt, you know, the character played by Leonardo DiCaprio. And there's a point that he basically makes the point that no one's watching. Although the SEC exists, the Security Exchange Commission, and they should have noticed that he was doing fraudulent stuff, they, they only had like two guys in the whole SEC, that alphabet agency employed. They didn't have enough manpower. They didn't have enough support from the government to actually monitor the Security Exchange Commission. So how did the Wolf of Wall Street, and it's based upon a true story, how did the Wolf of Wall Street exist in, in the time of an alphabet agency meant to watch the industry because it was underfunded by the government? So one of the criticisms of, of Reaganomics is that it leads to a, a ship that's designed to just look at economic growth, but they're not paying attention to the dangers, like this wolf that is, is criminally uh, manipulating the market in, in New York. Or here, you've got this boat that could be about to go over a cliff here, and they're like, oh, steady as she goes, do 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 And this woman at the back is saying, hey, pay attention. You guys aren't watching where the economy is going. And instead of watching where the economy is going, they spend the time to criticize her. And they label her things like an equal fanatic and basically tell her to go get a job and shut up, whereas they're dangerously steering the economy over the cliff. So this is one of many criticisms of Reaganomics suggesting that they're not paying attention to what's important. So here we can look at the GDP growth in Canada and we can see the times of this is the Great Recession that we lived through back to the financial meltdown and no doubt we're going to have another blip right here with the COVID crisis. So, uh, we also have a section at the end here that I'd ask you to look at at home about the Canada Action Plan and President, or sorry, Prime Minister Harper investing in Canada. And we're going to look at that in the second half of this in a little bit. We have some cartoons here critical of uh, Reaganomics because of the sacrifices that are being made not to the capitalist, but the sacrifices made to the welfare state. Because the sacrifices are being made to the welfare state, or the public sector, or to the taxpayers, they're the casualties. They're the ones that are going to die, but the oligarchs, the rich, the elite, the 1%, um, who claim they've made sacrifices, the government who claim they've made sacrifices, they're still living the good life. So, this is the first half of the um, lesson. I think I'm going to get you to try to unpack that cartoon. So I'm going to stop it here. I'm going to get you to unpack that cartoon. Maybe get together in small clusters and talk about the A1 steps, you know, the steps of analyzing a cartoon. While you're doing that, I'm going to ship this part, this half off to the world of YouTube. And then we're going to do the second half, which looks at the global 
financial meltdown. And then we'll be done this section and ready for the midterm tomorrow.